Hello and welcome to Wealthian. I'm your host, Andrew Brill. As we wait for the next round of economic indicators to figure out where the economy inflation is headed, my guest today has some insight as to where it's all going for the rest of the year, and we'll get into that right now. I'd like to welcome Chris Casey to Wealthion. Chris is one of our RIA partners with Windrock Wealth Management. Chris serves as a trusted advisor to a diverse range of business owners and professionals advising them on financial issues impacting their companies and their personal wealth. Windrock has a unique approach to managing wealth, and we'll get into that and where things are headed. Chris, welcome to Wealthion. Yeah, how you doing? Thanks for having me, Andrew. So I, I got to ask, I was reading a little bit of your, about your bio on windrock windrockwealth.com, and your plan B is to be a professor. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, it, that was my plan B. If you ask anyone I know, like my sisters, they would they would say that's uh, that not viable because they say I'm on the patient's part. But uh, yeah, no, I, it's just something I toyed around with when I was in school, probably to evade the job market for as long as possible, but uh, went into finance instead. So let's talk a little bit about finance and Windrock. You guys are not your traditional uh, investment advisors. You have a lot of things. You're not just about the market. You're about some alternative investments. Explain to me just a little bit about Windrock's philosophy. Well, we definitely try to blend the best elements of what I would call kind of a family office type model, along with the traditional RIA, Registered Investment Advisor, independent firm. And we do believe in a couple of things. One is that especially in today's environment, you need to consider alternative investments. You should have more of an absolute return mentality. So don't be worried about benchmarking every little thing as far as the alternative side goes. Um, and that's really it. It's, it's, it's really not necessarily a philosophy that we have in all conditions, but it's one that we definitely embrace right now in this current environment. So let's talk about the current market a little bit. Your your view on the economic situation or how how things are playing out and and not to, we'll get into your outlook, but what what do you think what do you think of things right now? It, it seems like we we can't get in uh, we have inflation somewhat under control. That last 1% is being really really stubborn. The jobs report just came in way above expected. What what's your take on the economy as we sit right now? Well, let's see. We had an earthquake in New York City. <laughs> yes, we last did. Week. We, we, we had an eclipse here in a few hours. It's what more signs do we need that there could be trouble down the down the road? And if this was a thousand years ago, you know, people would be running for the hills. Um, but right now, investors seem to take a mentality of I wouldn't call it necessarily irrational exuberance, but I would call it irrational complacency. Uh, no one's very concerned about the markets, financial markets. No one's very concerned about the economy. Uh, there's even headlines now that say all these people that predicted a recession, let's say nine, 12 months ago, are now kind of throwing in the towel and saying we won't have one. You know, I have a different view. I, I do think we could be in some really rough times in 2024. I do think it's very likely we could have a recession. Uh, I think there's some very ominous signs pointing in that direction. And on top of that, we're going to have potentially some uh, strife with the upcoming election. Uh, and then even at, towards the end of the year, I think eventually we're really going to be talking about a solvency crisis for, for the United States dollar. So what are some of the things you, you said you, you see some of the signs? What are some of the signs you're looking at that have you a little bit concerned? I mean, I was concerned Friday when I felt my house shake, of course. But, you know, I, I don't want to see the economy shake, but... It, there are two totally different, I think, views. Some say that we're in a recession. Some say that, you know what, there's no soft landing. There's no landing at all, which means we're probably not going to have a recession. So what are the signs you are seeing that kind of point you into that trouble you see in 2024? Well, I think it's important to point out, first of all, that a lot of people, a lot of pundits, a lot of economists, a lot of government officials will talk about whether or not we have a recession. And for the most part, they're reading tea leaves, right? They're just looking for uh, particular signs. I mean, Greenspan was famous for this. You may remember articles about him, like in the bathtub studying steel production uh, output. Um, and if you don't have a theory of what causes a recession, you can't weave all these indicators together. It's not really going to be meaningful, either magnitude or timing or probability. And you know, I particularly subscribe to the Austrian school of the business cycle, which 
blames the Federal Reserve or any central bank for recessions. It explains all the phenomena that we see within a recession. And probably the best indicator of whether or not it's playing out in the Federal Reserve admits this himself uh, is the, uh, the inverted yield curve. Uh, typically, when the yield curve inverts, so the short-term rates are higher than longer-term rates, you will see a recession anywhere from, say, 6 to 22 months after that. We're at, we're at month 15, so we're right, right kind of in the kill zone of where we would expect something. That doesn't mean it's going to happen right away, but it would argue that people should be more concerned than less concerned. Now, we, I know that a lot of people say that you don't know about a recession until you're either in one or past one. Are we at that point where, like, oh, my God, we're going to look back and say, yeah, yep, we were definitely in a recession. Everyone was wrong. Yeah, and, and typically the Federal Reserve is the one that's the most wrong. I mean, as you recall, Bernanke in January of 08 is on record as saying we don't see a recession happening. So if anyone sees it in, in hindsight, it's the Federal Reserve. Um, there are a lot of indicators which are at recession levels, right? You look at there's cracks in the labor market now, whether you look at job openings. Uh, you can look at various indices like the leading indicators. You can look at the PMI. Um, you look at um, uh, the inverted yield curve for me is the strongest, as well as the, the destruction of the money supply or the, the decrease in the money supply year over year. Uh, but whether or not we're in one right now, I can't say, but... You, it's definitely possible. Yeah, we, there, there. I, I know there, there's cracks in some things, but the labor market. There were three over three hundred thousand jobs created in the last report that came out just this past week. Are those real jobs, or are people settling? I, you know, I, I had spoken to someone that said that there, there's a a skill differential, like the jobs that are open don't match the skills of the people who are looking for jobs. Are people now settling? And that's why we're cre seem to be employing so many more people. It's like, well, you know what? I don't have the skills to do that job or my skills are way above that job, but I'm going to take that job because I need one. Yeah, this is the underemployment phenomenon, which I think is, is definitely there. I'm not a labor uh, economist or labor expert, but I, I do see headlines or some analysis where even whenever you see, it's always suspect. We try not to be focused on any given month. We try to take a much longer term perspective, but it's a pretty um, typical fact pattern, right? You'll see a great uh, jobs growth, job creation reported number, and then not too long in the, in the, in the future, uh, they'll retract it, right? It's, it's been modified or adjusted down significantly. I saw some headlines for this latest one where, you know, a lot of it's temp workers, a lot of it's uh, migrants. Um, it's not necessarily, um, you know, the, the type of blue collar, white collar, uh, full time jobs you would expect. So I can't answer that for sure, but but I do um, I, I, I view any given month with with some suspicion. So I don't want to be gloom and doom, but how bad can this be? Uh, you, you obviously, I mean, you you look at a year at a time and you're looking out through 2000, the end of 2024, how bad can this be? And there's people that saying the stock market is just going to continue to go up. There's some that say, well, this is going to be bad and there's going to be a retraction. How bad can this be? Well, it could be bad. There, there are indications that would suggest it could be very bad. And I'll give you a couple, a couple of points. One is that if you're just looking at the money supply growth, and it's been negative now for a good 15 months. That's rarely happens in the last 60 years. It's rarely happened, right? It's never happens where on any given month, it's a negative uh, over 6%. That has happened repeatedly recently. It also has not happened where it's been a full 15 straight months where it's been negative month in, month out. The last time that happened was the Great Depression. Another point that's akin to the Great Depression is that the overall destruction of money supply. So from 2020 over the next couple of years, the Federal Reserve increased the money supply by around 50%, right? We go from 15 trillion to around 21, 22. Well, now they've destroyed, they've, they've destroyed around $2 trillion of money. So we're down around 12%. That's pretty much the exact same magnitude that was done in the Great Depression. So there are some signs, I'm not saying that's the level we're going to get at, but there are some very disturbing similarities that are out there. So we 
look at the markets and we worry that <laughs> they could go down. What does it mean for financial markets? I mean, there, there's, look, our viewers worry about, you know, our viewers range in age and, and our demographics somewhere between 45 and 65, seven years old. So we have people who are still working really hard and probably have 20 years left to work to the people who are in retirement or thinking about, hey, you know, maybe I can retire. How bad can the markets be and what can someone do to protect themselves? Right. Well, at any age, no one likes to take a big drawdown in the markets, right? Especially when you're nearing retirement, you just can't afford that. So I think people, especially in that situation, should be especially concerned. As far as what to do about it, to the extent you are in equities, I would be very defensive. You know, what's that mean? I would avoid companies that are highly cyclical. Those industries I would avoid. I would avoid companies that are highly indebted or are barely, you know, so-called zombie companies that are prolific throughout the, uh, the Russell 2000. I would, um, I would actually favor high dividend yielding stocks as long as that dividend yield is sustainable. And there's different ways to measure that. But to me, that's always a good strategy because number one, uh, you're, you're earning money as you're waiting for any appreciation, right? Number two is that those prices can only diminish so far to the point where that yield really goes up, assuming that yield is sustainable or the, the uh, dividends are sustainable. So. In general, yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunity. You just have to be very defensive in the markets. So let's talk about the interest rates. It's obviously the the the, the one topic a lot of people are talking about. They, it now seems that everything that I'm reading now is like, oh, maybe two cuts. You know, we began the year at six or seven, then we whittled whittled that down to May, three. Now we're down to two. Where do you see interest rates going in 2024? Well, I'm not sure, but I would argue that the only people that are less sure than me would be the Federal Reserve. I don't think they know. And I think they've proven time and time again that they're extremely reactionary, right? They, whether they're predicting something, for instance, every year they're coming out with their a range of what they think GDP will be or rates, they're always wrong. And not just wrong, but typically the, the accurate number is ultimately outside their very range, right? So and look at how they reacted with inflation over the last couple of years, right? It was transitory. You know, it wasn't them. You know, everything they do is reactionary. So I don't think they know. They're really trying to have their cake and eat it too, right? So I think what they're trying to do is they, they, they want the so-called uh, curb inflation. That, that's definitely. But at the same time, they want a high stock market. And everyone talks about a dual mandate for the Federal Reserve, how they but it's really a triple mandate. I don't even know why they call it a dual mandate because they have to have reasonable uh, interest rates, a lower price level, you know, low unemployment. But the fourth uh, undocumented uh, uh, mandate would be that they want a high stock market. And it's a mistaken belief that it's good for the economy, but they're constantly trying to push that and jawbone the market up. And I think that's what they're doing here. They're always dangling the idea of they're going to cut rates, but whether or not they do, I don't think they know. We seem to have a robust economy right now. It seems that way when you look at a bunch of the numbers. Am I am I wrong in saying that, or does it look that way? There are some numbers that, at their face value, you know, seem fine that, that would indicate that we're not in a recession. Um, however, a lot of those would be, like you mentioned, the labor market uh, earlier. A lot of those what you call lagging indicators. So you know, they're, they're things that are the last to change. Do you see? Uh, they they look at the 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 CPI and they they look at the the numbers you know people spending money they can't get that number down I think it's around two point eight two point nine they want it at two if that starts to creep up do you see a scenario where they could actually raise interest rates a quarter of a point or an eighth of a point just to try and try and inch that down a little bit more I, I do see that um, by the way the two percent target is, is very strange. There's absolutely no academic literature why it should be 2%. In fact, I think it was Yellen at the time it said it's 2% because they want a margin before you get to zero. And there's nothing wrong with zero. I don't know why they're so scared of it. Um, so I could see that scenario happening, but probably a bigger concern is I could see rates increasing simply because the amount of debt that's being rolled over by the federal government, right? It's almost a third of the federal debt that's being rolled over this year. And that spells very serious issues for the fiscal um, situation for the U.S. government, 
and it should raise rates across the board in general. But if we raise rates, it's now going to cost the government more money to service the debt, which is going to increase the debt automatically. Yeah, it's it's a really negative debt spiral. Let me just put some numbers to that of, of what you're talking about. So at the end of 2022, the average rate of interest for the federal government, which has $34 trillion in debt, right, was around 1.5%. That, that's very low. That's great. It, a year later, it's around 3 and now when you're rolling it over a third of it, you could easily see it being north of 4%. When you're paying an effective rate of north of 4% on $34 trillion, now you're talking about a major line item in the budget that far exceeds most programs, including defense. If 2% is that cut, like a, a fictitious number, and I, we're, we're not sure why they say 2%, is inflation actually under control right now? Well, I suspect it's not. I mean, there are some good numbers, right, that have been happening for a while. But I think a good example is to look at the 1970s. In the 1970s, you look at 1974, 75, inflation was very, very high. Well, then it took some time off over a couple of years. But by the end of the decade, we look at 79, 80, 81, it's at 9 or 11 percent. I'm not saying we're going to get there per se, but I'm just saying that the battle against inflation is not over. So when you're you're I don't want to ask you for a prediction, but where do you think in, you know, looking at all the numbers, where do you think interest rates end up by the end of the year? I've heard, you know, four and three quarters, a little right around there, four and a half, which would mean a three quarter percent cut. I saw this morning a 0.6 percent cut. Where do you think it's going? Well, I do think the markets in the media is probably a little too focused on what the Fed would do per se versus what the interest rates are doing. So the Fed doesn't control all interest rates, obviously. It influences heavily the short-term interest rates because that's what they're buying, right? So whether or not they cut or not, and by the way, typically they actually follow the market. So even this latest cycle of, of raising rates, they typically were following what the market's already doing. Um, I would suspect, just based on the treasury rollovers that are happening this year, I would suspect based on the deficit that's likely to happen and the new issuance of debt, that rates should probably stay where they are, if not be increased from these levels. Would bonds be a good buy at this point if if you think that rates are going to go up or if rates are staying around where they are? Is Would this be a good time to buy bonds? Well, uh, it is nice earning you know, five plus percent or around five percent. That's great. However, I think people should be very concerned about buying anything on the long end of the spectrum. Um, if you don't believe me, ask you know Silicon Valley Bank. It's you, you could be set up for a big downfall if you do that. So if rates are increasing, you may want to stick to short term and keep rolling it over. Um, that's not to give investment advice, but I, I would be very nervous about the long end of the the bond range. It's with, with the debt the way it's going and the the way the the country has to borrow money. You know there are countries that that are are downgraded and they're they're not doing well? Is the United States in that position where, you know, our rating could be downgraded and our bonds are not worth as much? Well, it's already happened, right? It's, it, I think we went from like A plus to A or whatever the, the rating was. It happened about a year ago. It actually happened uh, right after the OA crisis, or, I believe, originally by S&P. Um, but if you're talking about a serious downgrading, like something that actually affects interest rates, what the auctions are going for, um, yes, I do think we're at a solvency crisis. I mean, or we will be. And it's something that people aren't really talking about. But just look at the numbers. Uh, so, for instance, right now we have $34 trillion in debt in the United States. And they take in, forget about the budget. What really matters is the tax revenue they take in. And in given, any given year, it's around 4 to $5 trillion, right? Recession, you're going to take easily 20 25% off those uh, the revenue. So let's say it's... $5 trillion. That's no different than someone who makes 50000 a year and has 350000 340000 in credit card debt. It, it's never going to be repaid. And the only thing they'll do is go right back to the same playbook and inflate the, their way out of it. That's the only recourse they have because they can't, they're not going to overtly default, but they'll covertly default by just printing more money. So, but printing more money creates a, a much different problem in that they're, you're just adding, you're kind of throwing fuel on the fire. I totally agree. It's it's not the resolution you need. What they should be doing is cutting spending, 
you know, trying to restructure debt to longer term. We had that opportunity years ago. It's unfortunate that we didn't issue, you know, 50 year bond or what have you. Um, and doing what you can to grow the economy as quickly as possible, you know, cutting regulation, uh, cutting taxes. That That's really the only prescription that, that would work. So talk to me a little bit more about the dollar. And there seems to be many other countries. China is having financial issues. Uh, a lot of countries are in a recessionary kind of position. And the U.S. is the only one that's saying, oh, our economy is great. And how is that when everybody else is struggling? Well, it's been a long time now where people keep calling the dollar you know, the, the, the least dirty shirt in the closet, right? Where it, it's true. Um, however, things are changing, right? The, the U.S. through um, through sanctions and whatnot has made people very hesitant, whether it's China, China's the best example, about investing in the U.S. and in holding treasury bonds in particular. And when you do that, you're decreasing the demand for the dollar. And so right now, the dollar is on a relatively strong basis, but it could be years from now. Once it falls against other currencies, it could fall pretty hard. And it's uh, it, there's other countries, obviously, they're trying to dig out and trying to become stronger. How does that work where they buy our our treasuries or the bonds that, that we're selling and our money is actually going to them? Well, you know, we, we talk about there's other countries, you know, that are trying to have a stronger currency. I would. Um, we just saw that about a year ago with. Um, the BRICS countries, right? There was that rumor that they were going to maybe accept a gold or a specie backed type currency. I would suspect that no one's going to do that because if they do that, yes, their currency is much valued much more highly. Yes, it's probably it's very beneficial for their economy, but central bankers don't want to do that. They don't want to relinquish the control of the money supply. They don't want to give up all the tools, or it's really the only tool, it's a hammer in their, um, in their toolbox. And that's what they would be doing. So I, I would suspect any competing currencies looking to get stronger probably won't embrace such a radical step. So I want to talk about debt a little bit. And you, you mentioned, obviously, that the country is $34 trillion. But it seems that credit card debt in this country is up. The car loans defaults are are up. So clearly, it's it's obvious that people are borrowing against credit cards, which is probably one of the worst things you can do. And they're having a problem paying back the debt. This has to be an indicator of how the economy is doing as well. Is it not? I believe so. And it's not just credit cards, right? You'll see that with auto loans, what have you. I mean, it's across the board. That's really outrageous. And you've probably seen this yourself. I noticed, you know, just six months ago, I was probably getting inundated with new credit card offers. And now they're just, they dried up. They're not doing that. So I wouldn't be surprised if banks um, are cutting back significantly, both on the lines of credit and new offerings and raise. And you can see with rates are rates are out of control. Uh, the credit cards that they're charging. Yeah. And it, I, look, I get I get offers all the time, either, you know, lower your interest rate or take more time to pay. I'm like, no, thanks. I'll pay my credit card bill off every month because it, it to me, it's just a you know, it's just like using cash. It's like, look, I'll just I'll just pay this off because the 29 percent is just absurd. But it gets a lot of people into a very, very desperate hole. It certainly does. I mean, it's one of the easiest things you can do is just not, you know, cut down your credit card debt. Um Back to U.S. government, though, I mean, even though that rate is nowhere near where we're at, it's the same sort of a debt spiral. It's the exact same thing because it's it's just something that can never be paid back. And it's what a lot of households and people find themselves in. Is it for, for the country, Chris, is it as simple as cutting back spending and and cutting things that, uh, you know, raising taxes a little bit just to try and bring a little bit more money in? Is that how we get this under control? Well, I personally think that the the problem is so big that it almost doesn't matter what you do. It's 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 a major problem. So it would take the most draconian, the, you know, the, it's just politically not feasible to do what needs to be done. Number one is just to get a handle on entitlement spending, right? That that'll never happen in any political climate, no matter who's in control of Congress, no matter who's in the White House. So I'm pretty pessimistic on the long term fiscal chances of U.S. government. Um, but yeah, it's it's a pretty easily, it's a pretty easy formula. It's just that it's something you could pass. So if we're that worried about our government and our, our fiscal health, 
do we all just run out and buy gold? Well, somebody has been because it's, it's run up quite a bit. You know, it's been a good year. Um, precious metals are, you know, always a good uh, hedge against any kind of instability in general, currency, financial, what have you. They're always a good hedge against inflation. But we've, even though with those two causes, which you could say have diminished over the last couple of years, right? Because we're fairly long in the tooth with the Ukraine war. Um, you know, inflation has gone down from its highs from a couple of years ago. Um, so what's what's really motivating? What's what's creating that demand? And one thing you'll notice is that central banks are probably this will probably be the second year in a row where they're hitting record high purchases of precious metals. Um, now, being a natural contrarian, I consider that a bad sign, right? But maybe they learned their lesson. They were unloading. You know, the UK was famous for unloading all their gold in two thousand one, which was the last time, you, the worst possible time to do it. But I think they wised up and they are, they are buying quite a bit of gold. But I think there's more than that. I suspect it's not the retail investors yet, but they will come down eventually and start buying. It's probably, I'm guessing, the more the so-called smart money, right? It's the family offices, it's the hedge funds. I think they're loading up on gold because they see the end game here, what happens uh, with the fiscal situation in the U.S. Right, gold is up 10% this year, $500 in the, the last a calendar, you know, 52 weeks. It, it, what is driving it? Is just, it, it, is demand for gold that high or people just saying, hey, look, this is a, a good investment and it, it's just not going to go down that much? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, we're, we're doing this without even much more retail presence. I mean, go to any registered investment advisor and ask them how much gold their clients have. And the answer is probably zero to 1% at most, right? So there's, there's a lot of upside from a demand aspect. Um, silver may even be more attractive. You know, this the gold to silver ratio right now is over 80. You know, whenever that happens, those high levels uh, from the 80 to 120, it's been, it starts looking really attractive. And silver has different supply and demand dynamics than gold. You know, every every ounce of gold that's ever been mined exists right now somewhere. Whereas silver is actually consumed, you know, like in a tr- electronics, uh, solar, what have you. And the other aspect is that silver its supply is a byproduct of other mining. So to the extent you have an inflationary uh, recession, I would imagine that that supply of silver dries up if people are cutting back on copper or what have you, uh, other by, you know, other main mining um, uh, ores that they're looking at. So in some ways, silver has a much better supply and de- demand dynamic going forward. So if somebody wanted to buy gold or, or add that to, to their portfolio at this point, what percentage are they looking at? Or is that something you advise them to do, would advise them to do? Yes. It's not just how much gold, but it's also in what fashion and, and how you store it, for, for example. So I could say that the vast majority of our clients have precious metals. Um, you know, it could be fairly significant. Significant, I mean, like 10 plus percent, uh, depending on the situation. Everyone's situation is different. Uh, and then it also matters well, how you're going to own it. Are you going to buy it on an ETF? Or are you going to own it physically? We're big believers that you should always own it physically. You should always be able to access it if necessary. Uh, and so that's what we do for clients. But it's not gold isn't considered the the like equity as, as like a, a regular stock. It's that's sort of a buy and hold on to it for a really long time sort of thing, isn't it? I think that's a good mentality to have. And by the way, it's probably a good mentality to have with with most investments. I think. Um, but yes, you know, the, the biggest detraction from gold, people always say, is the opportunity cost, right? Because it's not it's not putting out any kind of dividend or yield versus, you know, the, what treasuries do. Um, however, given the situation, I think everyone should be looking at precious or considering precious metals. So let's talk a little bit about our upcoming, you know, elections and the rest of the year. The Fed says they don't really whatever they're going to do with interest rates. They want they they don't want to do it close to the election. How quickly do you think if people are saying June, July? Look, July is not far from the. It's only four months from the election. So if they don't really want to touch interest rates before the election, we're getting really close to that danger zone, aren't we? We are. And July is also one or two months before the conventions, which is a big deal, right? Um, like I said before, I don't know if they're going to do anything. I suspect they don't know. I suspect nothing's going to happen this year. They're just trying to talk the markets up. Um, that's how I think it, it may play out. 
how is this election affecting our financial markets? I, you know, there's some that I, I know some think one president is better for the markets, the other president is worse for the markets. How do you see it playing out at this particular point in time? Well, it's hard to say because I actually suspect uh, it's not so much a matter of who wins, but who runs. I'm not convinced that President Biden will actually be the nominee. I, I strongly suspect he would be replaced at the convention. I, I could see that happening. This is the most natural time to do it. Um, and on Trump, uh, I don't know. He, it's I, First of all, I have to pay him a compliment. His stamina for his age is amazing. I mean, to run for president, to oversee a business empire, and to deal with all these litigious matters at the same time is, is absolutely amazing. Anyone that's ever been involved in litigation knows it's extremely stressful and time consuming. So I don't know how he does it, first of all. Um, but they are determined not to have him run. So we have to see how that plays out as well. Are there, and, and you've followed the markets a lot longer than I have, are there market predictors that can tell us who may win this election? Well, I think the best indicator as far as election is looking at the gaming houses, right? Where you could actually bet on it. Because forget the polls. The, po- the polls are terrible for the last 10, 15 years, right? Since you can't you can't call a household anymore. Um they're extremely suspect. Um, I I like the the gaming houses and the odds they place because that's real money at stake, right? That's that's real money people are putting down. It's not a prediction with someone that doesn't have skin in the game. So I think yeah, there's a lot of indicators out there. That's probably the best one. I think we need to call up a sports book and say, hey, look, you know what? Let's start betting on how much and when the Fed is going to start lowering rates or raising rates for that matter, because it's it seems to be a huge game in in the media and with everybody that's investing is like, oh, no, it's coming down. No, it might be going up. No, it's going to stay the same. I feel like there's a parlay at stake here. You know, let's talk offline about getting that started. <laughs> It's uh, you're right. I'm actually surprised that doesn't exist. Uh, if it does, I'm sure um, Mr. Pelosi would be great at it. What are we looking at for the rest of this year? Right now, the stock market last week had a little bit of a blip. We had a great first quarter, and I'm not sure it wasn't profit taking at the beginning of the, the second quarter. You know, in the first week of the second quarter, or if it was concern over what the Fed Chairman Powell was saying or what other presidents of feds were saying, you know, where, where are we going for the rest of 20, uh, 2024? And I know that you don't have the crystal ball, but from everything you're seeing, w- what is your outlook and what are you doing for your investors? Well, I see the, there's a lot of danger signs, right? We've already talked about everything from, you know, the money supply destruction to the inverted yield curve to election chaos. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of problems out there too. The solvency of the U.S. government. Um, I think everyone should be have a defensive mindset. Uh, you have to be defensive in order to play offense down the road as well. Uh, so that should be first and foremost on everyone's mind is capital preservation. So, Chris, one of my last questions is: How is somebody making money today? I, you know, I, I've I've heard the saying: You're going to make you 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 have to do something else with your money to make money. You're not going to get rich at your vocation. So how, how are we making money today? There's always opportunities, no matter how bad things are, there's always an opportunity somewhere, right? Uh, there's a lot of things that we've liked and have liked over the years that I think investors should think about. It could be anything from pri- private credit, which I think is a great way to earn some interest. It could be precious metals, it could be cryptocurrencies, uh, which people should embrace. Um, there's always opportunity out there, but there, and, and it's, I think, even easier to avoid the real problem areas because um, there are some areas, you know, avoid anything where, that's heavily indebted, anything that's highly cyclical. Um, obviously, commercial uh, real estate is going to be a mess for some time, uh, but the, there's, there's always opportunity. So I, I want to ask you about cryptocurrency since you brought it up. You guys at Windrock have been a proponent of cryptocurrency for a long time. You've been in it. You... I, I, you know, are a proponent of it. What do you see out of cryptocurrency? There's so many different opinions, but what do you guys, obviously, because you're a, you know, you talk about it. What do you see from cryptocurrency this year, next year, and into the future? Yeah, we actually wrote about Bitcoin in particular back in 2014. So you're right. We're, we're kind of an early adopter 
Uh, we've had a number of clients invest in cryptocurrencies over the years. I'm not the real in-house expert. My colleague Brett is. Um, I think now is an interesting time because we've had a great run up uh, with the Bitcoin halving that's occurring. You you could argue there's a lot more of a run up to take place. But on the other hand, just like anything, even some safe things, there's a downturn in the market. It's one of the first things that's sold, right? Because everyone's trying to be liquid. Everything's, there's always a sell off. And you saw this in 2020, gold, Bitcoin, everything sold off. So I would say uh, it's, it's definitely something to have on your radar screen. But whether you're investing right now, it's probably a different conversation. Last thing I have to ask you about is oil. Oil, $85 to $90 a barrel. A lot of geopolitical issues overseas. Where is oil going? And how is this going to f affect us? Well, you know, we, we bought oil, uh, a lot of it back, you know, when uh, it went negative, the w WTI went negative uh, a number of years ago. Um, I One thing I've noticed that I, I probably have come to appreciate over, over the last couple of years is that myself and probably the market in general is probably a little too focused on the demand side of the equation and not pay, doesn't pay enough, enough uh, attention to the supply side. And we have a real war going on right now. There's real supply destruction that's taking place. There's like there's a massive amount of capital that's not being deployed in exploration or distribution. And that's why you see it with, um, for instance, one of the best returning assets this year are MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships, because you know there's no new pipelines being built. Um, so I can't say where oil is going per se, but I do like the energy sector for this very reason that there's a massive amount of supply destruction or lack of supply being brought online. So in general, we like energy. I think in the in the first quarter, energy energy was the best performing sector, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So there you go. So you, you guys have been spot on and uh, you know I appreciate what you guys do. And hopefully if you've you know, enjoyed what Chris has said. You will reach out to Windrock and, uh, you know, go to Wealthion.com and we will point you in the direction of Windrock. And Chris is one of the guys you'll be speaking to to help you preserve and grow your wealth. Chris, where can we find you on social media? Oh, uh, well, obviously our website is probably the best place to go. It has, we catalog all of our research and papers there and speaking opportunities. That's windrockwealth.com. Um, we're, we're on Twitter right, or X right now too, but I, Unfortunately, I can't remember the handle. I think it's at Windrock Wealth. But um, yeah, find us either place. We will we will get that up on the screen for you. And uh, we will make sure that, you know, people can find you on X. I, I like you still call it Twitter, but <laughs> that's going to be uh, that's going to be a, it's going to be a long time before we can just say, oh, yeah, you, you can find me on X. But uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your insights. I think, uh, you know, everybody can can listen to you and, and grow their wealth and preserve their wealth. And uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. That's a wrap on another discussion here on Wealthion. Thank you for joining us. If you need help being financially resilient, please head over to Wealthion.com and sign up for a free, no obligation consultation from one of our vetted registered investment advisors. And remember to follow us on social media for the latest news and information to help you invest wisely. Thank you for watching. And until next time, stay informed, stay empowered, and may your investments flourish. Thank you.